Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Snow, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Human Flourishing here at OU. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our first last lecture of this academic year. Before I get to that, and our last lecture is being given by Coach Sherry Cole, as you all know. <laughs> okay, guys, since this is really a great crowd, let's do something different. Sherry, 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 <laughs> Sherry, Sherry. <laughs> uh, I want to give a, a special shout out to a number of people who are here. Uh, Gail St. John from Norman High taught with Coach Cole when Coach Cole taught English there. Hey, Gail. There are a number of people from the Institute that I want to give a shout out to. We have three brand new postdocs, Drs. Lonnie Watson, Megan Haggard and Michael Warren, our visiting scholar, Dr. Karsten Nielsen from Denmark, my GRA, Jordan Joyra, Dean Kelly Danfus, Dean Nicole Campbell, Ms. Lillian Miller, Jill Hughes from the College of Engineering, and our own Kyle Harper, Provost. Last but not least, I want to thank the students from my section, Philosophy and Human Destiny, for coming today. There they are. Hey, students. So, after the talk, but before the Q&A, we're going to ask you to do a survey on an iPhone if you have one. If you don't have one and you'd like to do the survey, we have iPads available for you. I'll give you further instructions after the lecture. But for now, I want to say how thrilled and honored we are to have Coach Cole give our lecture. Coach Cole graduated from Oklahoma Christian University and received her first coaching assignment as assistant coach at Edmond Memorial High School. She came to OU and took over the head coach position in 1996. Her achievements are well known, both here and across the nation. They include six Big 12 regular season championships, the 112 Academic All Big 12 Honors, 17 straight NCAA appearances, and four Academic All America team members, to name a few. Off the court, court Coach Cole is pushing her players to achieve excellence within the community. Each season, her players find a way to give back to the community by volunteering for nonprofit organizations and working in the Big Sis program. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Coach Sherry Cole. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. When they put these little things on my face, I feel kind of like Garth Brooks. <laughs> Somebody on the front row said Britney Spears. I'm way closer to Garth Brooks than I am Britney Spears. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to speak for the um, Institute of Human Flourishing. Uh, I, I think, I mean, like, who doesn't want to do that, right? Like, I, I think that's the bait that I swallowed when it, the ask came through my computer. Um, yeah, I want to flourish, so you bet I'll be a part of that. How in the world do you say no <laughs> to that? As I started thinking about what my remarks would be tonight, I couldn't help but think about the late Carnegie Mellon professor, Randy Posh, who delivered the original last lecture, that bullseye arrow to the soul that he, in which he did not waste a word, a sentence, a thought in the entire lecture. And when I think about Randy Posh, I think about the clarity that he was provided as he stood on the precipice of, an, of numbered days, and that's a clarity that many of us aren't afforded, and yet it was his ability and his willingness to share that clarity that was his great gift. And for all of us who have been exposed to his thoughts and his words, we're all the better for it. From the day we're born until the day we die, we're all chasing something, whether we want to admit it or not. The gravitational pull of the carrot is the underpinning of our story. 
who we are, what we chase, how we chase it, why ultimately defines us. When I was a little girl in Hilton, Oklahoma at Sunset Elementary School, I loved recess. Like, I, you know, like the rest of you, I loved recess. I loved playing kickball. I loved playing on the monkey bars. I loved swinging. I loved playing tag. But more than anything, I loved spinning on these silver bars. To this day, I don't really even know what they are, but the, these about this big, this silver bar, and you started where you just put your belly over it, and you held onto it, and you turned flips, and then you would sit backward, and you would turn some flips. My favorite thing to do was to put my knee over it, one knee over it, and lock it in, and turn, and go as fast as I possibly could. I would go as fast as I could, and I would end up with blisters on the bend of my knee, and I was so, so not a rebel in elementary school, or even still today, but especially then, And yet, if the bell rang to go in at recess and I was in the middle of a personal best of flips, (laughs) wasn't going, wasn't going to happen. I got a little bit older in the fourth and fifth grade and it was SRAs, all right? Um, These were little color-coded stories that you got to read and on the back were a bunch of questions and comprehension and vocabulary. And they were all color-coded, and when you got through one color, then you got to go to the next box and get the next colors. And we had a portion of our day that was dedicated to that, and yet when we finished our homework, that's what we were asked to do to stay quiet and not be rowdy. And so I would race through my math homework and through my science homework and through my history homework so that I could get to the SRAs. Because I not only wanted to be deeper in aqua blue than everybody else in my classroom, I wanted to be in yellow, which was beyond aqua blue. And I would even ask to stay after school sometimes. I'm that guy who wanted to get a little deeper in the box because I was absolutely intoxicated by the chase. Then I found a basketball, and I went to Lindsay All-Star Camp in the summer of my sixth grade year, and I learned how to do all these crazy ball handling drills, and I bought this little notebook that had a red plastic binder, and it had graphs and charts where you could actually write down how many you got in 30 seconds or a minute, and I took that home, and I would go in my granny's kitchen, and she had this white tiled linoleum floor with little blue flowers in the corners of each of the tiles, And in the kitchen, right above the oven, was this clock with a red rim that no doubt she got at TG&Y. And it's sort of one of those that clicked around and made noise. It was perfect. It was the perfect setup. So I would dribble with my left hand and stare at the clock. And when it kerplunked to 12, then I would take off. And I would do my ball handling drills and count them and time them. And occasionally the ball would careen into the oven. I never broke it that I know of. Strong glass on those ovens. And uh, I would race. And I would try to get one more today than I got yesterday. I could never get enough. When I got to high school, I ran the quarter mile, I memorized poetry, I learned how to type. Oh my gosh, I fell in love with typing. I learned on a manual typewriter that was in, of all places, sort of the breakfast nook of our kitchen, and it was on a a very peculiar end table that didn't have a chair, and so I would stand like this and type. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their country as fast as I could go while my mom was cooking supper. It was just something about racing. And so then I took a business class by Miss Lavana Dodd, and she tapped my back with a ruler and told me how to sit up really straight and relax my wrists. And every day, the start of typing class began with a timed writing where I could go as fast as I wanted. She would say, ready? You may begin. And I was gone. There's not a day that I shot in the Hilton High School gym that I did not time what I did or count the shots that I made or measure and record. I wanted to always know where I stood. There was something absolutely intoxicating about the air of competition for me. For as long as I can remember, I have had a love affair with the bar. And so I have made raising it for others my life's work. So when I thought about what I wanted to share with you really tonight, um, I thought, well, I'm going to get this thing to points of three because research shows us that people remember best in bullet points of three. That's how the human mind works. And so I started laying out these points, and I would fold them together, and I would always end up with four. It didn't matter. I kept always ending up with four, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I don't want to do four because my players are probably there, and they would just want to do three and get the heck out the door. And I don't want to do four because I got this really good friend who might actually be there, and he's here. I see him, and he counts four on the highway. And when he looks at a bird in the sky, he looks for the fourth one, and he's going to think that I'm doing this just to torture him, which I might be. And then I thought, you know what? The pinnacle of my profession is four, right? That's the teams. Those are the ones that you remember when it's all said and done. So I decided that it was best maybe not to argue with the gods 
and I just left it at four. So here's the trick of the night. You get to remember any three of the four you want. You can pick and choose. Number one, it's all about the stretch. I'll tell you, I hate physically stretching. Like, like I don't not like it. I hate it. Okay? I, I'm an athlete who's exerted my body throughout my entire life, and I now take Pilates, and I run to hot yoga whenever I can, and I foam roll, and I hang upside down by my feet, and I stretch all the time. But it's like that thing where bending my bending over to touch my toes or turning sideways to bend makes me make those sounds that come out of delivery rooms like people who are in the throes of labor. It is awful. Like, I would rather run 10 miles than stretch. I don't like it. It's painful. It's annoying. No matter how you slice it, it takes a lot of time. And yet I do it. And you know why I do it? I do it because I want to play tennis and I want to jog. And let's be completely honest, I do it because I really like to walk up and down stairs and I like to be able to get in and out of a chair. It's necessary, and never, ever, ever have I done it and not felt better on the other side. When I was in the ninth grade, Mrs. Mitchell, my English teacher, put The Pearl by John Steinbeck on my desk, and she said, I would like for you to read this for the state competition that's coming up in the spring. She walked away, and I think I went, huh? She gave me no instructions. She gave me no assistance. She told me the date of the competition and handed me the dime store book and left. And so that was my introduction to the literary giant John Steinbeck. And I got to tell you, it read like Russian to me. Somewhere, though, between the covers of that $2 paperback, I learned about allegory and symbolism. And when I finished the book, the world just looked different to me. And I was hooked on that process. I remember it felt like I had wrestled a gorilla to get to the end, but when I got to the end, it was like somebody pulled the curtain back on wow, and I'm like, I want some more of this. So I pushed repeat. And I read A Day in the Life of, Ale of Ivan De Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and I read a poem called The Naming of Parts by Henry Reed, and I read a Shakespearean tragedy called Troilus and Cressida. And each and every time, my world just got bigger. And I remember thinking, as I finished those, that this is not getting any easier. It never did. But that grappling with form and function and language, I got better at. And I always loved what it opened up for me on the other side. You know, in the movie, A League of Their Own, um, there's this, uh, Tom Hanks plays this coach whose name is Jimmy Dugan, and uh, he is the coach of an all-girls baseball team, right? Gina Davis plays Dottie Henson, who's the star of the team, and at this, it, at this really difficult juncture in this straight-up hill climb that they have set out as, as, as a team over the course of this season, she just gets off the bus, takes her bags, and heads for the door. And he says, whoa, what are you doing? Where are you going? And she says, I'm done. It's too hard. And he said, it's too hard. What are you talking about? And she said, it's too hard. And he said, too hard. Of course it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. If it weren't, everybody would do it. It's the hard that makes it great. It's the stretch. Learning is always full of discomfort. It always reeks of that thing. And yet, it is getting through to the other side that is so fulfilling. It's not, I'm not always a fan of Pilates stretching, but I'll tell you what, while I don't necessarily love the doing, I am crazy wild about what happens when you get to the other side. Number two, it's not about what you get at the end. In 1996, when I coached at Norman High School, uh, we had a really, really good team a team that in 1995 had, had gone undefeated throughout the entire year and been upset in the state semifinals. We actually played in the state semifinals, a team that we had beaten by 30 in the area finals, and they came through the loser's bracket and got us on the campus of Oral Roberts University at the Maybe Center, and they got us, got us by three. At the end of a game in which the ball had just gone daggum square on us, we couldn't make a layup, we couldn't make a free throw, we couldn't pass, we couldn't catch, and we scratched and clawed. I remember at halftime telling my guys, you know what, the second half cannot be any worse, right? Right, the, uh, the quintessential halftime speech, we got this, guys. Second half was exactly a replica of the first, and the final score was 40 to 37. 
I'll never forget the hollow faces and the feelings of those players um, after that game. They were absolutely broken because they and we as a coaching staff had given every fiber of our being to that run, and we were left empty-handed. People were disappointed. You know, back then, girls' basketball couldn't get in the newspaper to save their lives, and yet we got upset, and so we had the front-page picture of my point guard with her head in her hands and her face all soiled from crying. And in that spring when we came back, it was a pretty rough spring. I remember going back to school and it's spring break and, and I would have somebody, you know, a teacher would come up to a player and say, oh, you guys had a terrific year and the player would fall down on the floor and start crying again and they would tell me, you got one down in the library and I would go and find her. <laughs> it was just hard. And that summer we played in a summer league at Western Heights. We would get on our vans and we would grow across Oklahoma City and we would get out of the van like little soldiers and we would walk onto, into the gym and just annihilate people. I mean, run them ragged. There was very little joy. It was completely sur surgical, but when we were finished, we would walk out, get back in the van, and come back to Norman. This happened throughout the, the summer months. When the spring or when the fall rolled around, we're in the old South Gym practicing and I remember thinking, boy, this just doesn't feel right. Our guys weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't doing absolutely anything wrong. They hadn't messed up a drill. They didn't have a bad attitude. Nobody was talking back, but it just didn't feel right. And I remember walking to my assistant coach at half court and saying, what's, what's going on with these guys? Ah, they just know. They know what happened last year. They, they know how long the season is. It's going to be fine. And we had a great team. Everybody was back. We were loaded for bear. I said, okay, I'll give us some time. I gave it two weeks, and it felt like an eternity to me. At the end of that two weeks, I'm walking up back on the practice gym floor one day, and I'm like, this doesn't feel right. And so I just blew my whistle and said, everybody to the locker room. And so they filed obediently to the locker room and sat down, all 15 guys just looking at the floor. Dead quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. I said, what's the deal? What's going on with you guys? Not a word. Not even eye contact. Everybody's just looking at the floor. Something in me made me ask the question, what are you afraid of? And you know what was in me that made me ask it because I was afraid too. I asked him, what are you afraid of? Nobody breathed. I said, oh, let me guess. You're absolutely terrified that you're going to sell out with every fiber of your being and want this so desperately. And then you're not going to end up winning at the end and it's all going to be for naught. And you don't ever want to feel like you did last spring again. And now I got 15 heads going like this. And so I, asked, I said to them, I got, I got news for you guys. Um, we're good enough that we can tiptoe through this thing and win it. We had a lot of talent in that locker room. And, and then I also want you to understand this, that we could give every fiber of our being and dive into this thing head first and not win it because that's the nature of sports. There are no guarantees. But I want you guys to understand something, that if you go – halfway in and win, it won't mean as much to you as if you go all in and lose because it is so not about what you get at the end. And I want you to understand that I only know how to do things one way, and that's full out. So if you're going to tiptoe through this deal, you're going to do it without me. And I left. And I got my car. And it bawled like a baby. I'm like, oh my God, i got to resign tomorrow. They're going to come with it. What am I going to do? So I go home wake up the next morning, do the things that high school teachers do, run around, taking phone calls, doing whatever. It comes time for basketball practice, and I'm running down the hallway to the old South Gym, and it hits me, well, I'm going to have to make a call today. Either they dive in head first or they don't, and i got to make that call. In like 15 seconds, i got to make that call. And I'm jogging down the hallway to the old South Gym, and I reach down to open those swollen wooden doors, and I knew immediately when I got there what my crew had decided to do. You could smell it, you could taste it, you could feel it. It was 110 in that sweat box, and everybody was completely soaked, and practice hadn't even started yet. They were laughing, they were talking, they were moving. And I walked to my assistant coach at half court and said, we're going to win it all. And he said, shut up. It was September. <laughs> I said, no, this is the real deal. And the following spring, we got on a big yellow bus, and we went to Tulsa, to the campus of Oral Roberts University, where we played in the state championship at the Maybe Center. 
And at the beginning of the game, it's so cool, they, they like had strobe lights and smoke and music, and you run out and you circle the court, and it was really big time. It was really, really cool. And we looked so tough and so strong running out. We were confident. We were picked to win it all. We come and we line up on the baseline, and the spotlight goes boom, and it locks on our guys. And every single one of them have crocodile tears rolling down their face. Suddenly, the strong were also the real. And they announced our players one by one, and then, then they announced our starting five, and then everybody ran to me on the sideline, and we did our huddle, and there was not one thing that I could say there that would change their destiny because the dream had been planted, and the, and the plan had been put into motion long, long ago. What was going to happen was going to happen. They had already determined that. At the end of the first quarter, the opposing coach had used all of her timeouts, and we were up by 20. At halftime, when we went in, we were up by 27, and coming out, we decided to call a play for our point guard to get a three in the third quarter, and she made it, and that made 30. As the game wore on, we had that magical fourth corner, quarter where you're allowed to, do, um, to, to give your seniors the credit that they deserve, you know, and take them out one by one so that the crowd can recognize them, and we did that, and we went all the way through, and Stacy Hansmeyer, who was our All-American who went to the University of Connecticut, um, was, was our last player to take off the floor. And she's standing at the free throw line. The official hands her the ball. She's literally sobbing so hard she can't make a free throw. Thank God Sepulpa was kind enough to foul her again so that we could try to get her out and get her recognized. And that we did. And when the game was over, we had won by 38 in the state championship. And I remember all the powers that be came out on the court, and they had the trophies, and they did all the pomp and circumstance, and all of that is super cloudy to me. We go into the locker room, and I remember all the questions from the media, because it's open locker room, and they come in, and isn't this great that you get the monkey off your back? Isn't this fantastic that you get to return the favor, and you get to do this thing in such a, an enormous fashion? And it all just droned on and meant nothing. I remember my point guard standing up on the chair and saying, Coach Cole, he doesn't get it. I said, you're so right. He does not. And when all that was done and the players were showered and I finished my obligatory media responsibilities, we got on the big yellow bus and we got about 20 miles outside of Tulsa before we realized that the gold ball was in the locker room. <laughs> and we had to go back and get it. True story. So not about what you get at the end. You know, what we were about was a recognition of rightness. It, it, it was about feeling what it's like to be part of something that's right. Because all those players who got to feel that, what they have going forward is an idea of right, which then ultimately gives them an idea of wrong. And even when things aren't exactly right in the future, they'll recognize it. Even if they don't know how to fix it, they will recognize it. And they will work toward that. And so they'll be different spouses and different employees and different parents and different friends because they recognize that and they will always be in pursuit of that pure air. And that pure air is what I'm talking about. Not perfection, that's not, the, that's not the goal. And I think that's really important to note. What I'm talking about is a heart wide open, try pulsing through your veins, and attempt to be better because you can. And if you can, why not? You know, Sarah Lewis in her book, The Rise, calls the pursuit of mastery an ever onward almost. And I love that. I love it because it speaks to a mode of travel rather than a destination. It's like a way of being. It's who you are and how you move. And I got to tell you, regardless of what you're chasing, it will never be about what you get at the end. Number three, spacing and timing are real. <laughs> They're real. They're important and they matter. Even if you don't recognize it at the time, and even if you can't do anything about it, they're real and they're important and they matter. We need all only look in the rearview mirror of our own lives to recognize the important role that they've played in where we are and who we have become. If you want to really think about what spacing is, all you got to do is think about having a conversation with a close talker. You know what I'm talking about. Like, like they cannot see this force field around me that says, don't walk here, please. And they just come in and they take your air and they give you their air and you don't want any of it and yeah space is pretty important right or how about if you get in the D boarding group for Southwest Airlines mm-hmm <laughs> try that on for size you think space doesn't matter when you walk down that aisle mm. yeah it really really does spacing 
is incredibly important on the basketball court as well. I don't know that there's a more important offensive thing, for lack of a better word, than spacing. Spacing is what puts the defense in a dilemma. Spacing is what gives offensive maneuvers a chance to be successful. Spacing, I tell my guys, is where the good stuff has a chance to grow. And you know what's crazy about that is? You can't control it by yourself. So much of it depends on the other guy. And timing? You need only, when you think about timing, think about the rise of ESPN and the rise of Connecticut women's basketball. Stores, Connecticut, Bristol, Connecticut. In the 80s, ESPN is becoming the source for sports at all level. In the 80s, Gina Oriema gets hired at the University of Connecticut. In the 90s, ESPN becomes the flagship, and they're looking for content. They want to push women's sports. 92, Rebecca Lobo signs with the University of Connecticut. 95, Connecticut wins it all. ESPN is there, and boom. Right place, right time, doing the right thing. Think about timing. You need only think about asking a soldier about D-Day and the head fake that was going on with the Germans, what, you were tr what we were trying to accomplish, and how important it was that the June weather broke when it did for the invasion in Normandy. Timing and spacing. In 96, I was coaching at Norman High School. About three blocks away as the crow flies from here. Oklahoma women's basketball team was in the toilet. We were winning championships. Right place, right time. That next fall, my assistant and I are recruiting. She goes to Canada to watch a player. The player stinks. She's not any good. She stops by another gym on her way to the airport. Stacy Dales was playing basketball. There was a couple of behind-the-back passes, a couple of lookaways. We go, wow, right place, right time. The connecting thread would be that all were doing the right thing. It's a cadence of play. You can't always control it but you got to be conscious of it. You know, um, you watch, you listen, you feel, you pay attention, and you try to find a way to fit in the rhythm of the dance. When you think about it, for all of us, what is the role that was played in terms of spacing and timing for who we marry, for the jobs that we take, for the houses we buy? for the trains that run over us, for the rocket ships we get to ride on, spacing and timing have a ton to do with that. And we can't always control it, but we can be conscious of it, and we can be prepared so that when we feel the rhythm of the dance, we're ready to add to it. And I think the important part of that is understanding not only how to handle the notes, but all the pauses that come in between. Number four, final four, finally. Take the time to invest in the people running beside you. I'm, re I'm really, really fortunate. Um, for the last 20 years, I've got to pick my team. I can tell you real quickly and real easily the guys that I want. I want gritty guys. I want guys who are not afraid of hard. I want curious minds. I want gutsy hearts. I want believers. I want Lloyd Christmas in, in uh, Dumb and Dumber, like maybe the worst movie in the history of the world. But, you know, Jim Carrey plays that guy. And he asks Mary, like, what are the odds of us, you know? And, and she says, um, no odds. And he says, like, like one in a hundred. And she says, like one in a million. And he said, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yes, I want that guy. I want that guy on my team. More than anything, I want guys who are all in. I want guys who dive in head first with every fiber of their being. I want guys who are willing to tell me I got food in my teeth. I want guys who will leave their judgment at the door and listen to my verbal vomit and divide it and find the stuff that matters, separate it from the stuff that doesn't. I want guys who are imperfect. I want guys who are, who are willing to unwrap themselves enough so that I can stick to them. I want guys who have warts and who recognize that their warts and my warts simply give us a chance to hang on to each other because that's what's really important. Invisible ties are the strongest ones, and connection is the pixie dust of life. There's this uh, remarkable documentary um, called Citizen Soldier, and it's made about um, uh, uh, the National Guard, men and women of the National Guard, who trained 39 years out of their, out of a, or 39 days, excuse me, 39 days out of a year 
to go to combat. 39 days, they're, they're normal people who spend 39 days tra training and then when called upon can go to the front lines to fight for our freedom. And in this particular documentary, it's about a group of guys from Oklahoma who um, their journey on the front line was documented, their journey in Afghanistan and Operation Brass Monkey. And in this, this culminating scene at the close of the documentary, these guys are sitting around a table and one of them says... It's a crappy place to have to live for a year. And he didn't say crappy, I did. It's a crappy place to have to live for a year. I'm not going to lie, though. I kind of miss it. It sucked to be there. But it was our suck. And every day you woke up and you knew the suck was yours. And you looked around and you knew who was going through the suck with you, and we owned that. You know, and I think about that, I get it in a way that maybe as close to uh, being in combat I can get, because I work with a team all the time, and when you suffer together, shared suffering just builds up those bonds. But it's hard to feel like that when every breath is not, ha does not have a 50% chance of being your last. You get there pretty quickly because the risk is pretty apparent. When we're here and it's safe, sometimes it's really hard to risk like that because we have so much to lose. It takes great courage. I'll tell you, um, I own one screenplay, a lot of films, but only one screenplay, and I bought it because the dialogue within it was so rich and so real. And the screenplay that I own is called Goodwill Hunting. It's one of my favorite films of all time. And... There are all kinds of fantastic dialogue scenes, but in one in particular, Sean, played by Robin Williams, Dr. Sean, is talking to Will, Hunt, Will Hunting, who is the, the brilliant orphan who has built this huge armor coat around himself to protect himself from the world because of a very, very painful childhood. And in this particular scene, Robin Williams and Matt Damon are sitting next to uh, a lake in a park. And as they sit there... Um, Sean, Robin Williams, is trying to decide whether or not he wants to spend any more time trying to help this brilliant kid who's fighting him every step of the way. And he says to him, Will, if I ask you about the Sistine Chapel, you can tell me all about it. You can tell me how big it is, all about the paintings that are there, but you have no idea what it feels like to stand in that space and look up at that ceiling. And if I ask you about love, I bet you can recite a sonnet but you don't have any idea what it feels like to sit next to your dying wife's hospital bed and have doctors and nurses walk by and look at you and know that the, the sign visiting hours does not apply to you. He says, you have kept yourself so locked away that I can't learn anything from you. And what I want you to understand, Will, is that unless you share you with me, there's no reason for us to continue. I can't learn anything from you. I can't learn from a book. If you want to tell me about you, I'm fascinated. But if you don't, and he says, next move is yours, chief. I love that scene because I think that speaks to all of us at some time or another. That is really, really hard to connect sometimes because the risk is so great. However, what's lying on the other side, the reward is completely off the charts. I have 30, I think, I'm adding, and I stink with numbers, about 30 years of coaching experience. And in that, I have all these hooks on which I can hang the moments of my coaching career. And you know what is not on those hooks? Scores, plays, titles, none. You know what's on the hooks? People. The people that were in the foxhole with me, the people that were in the trenches, the people that I locked arms with as we have run as hard as we can toward a place. When you give of yourself to others, you allow yourself to consume the pixie dust of life. This August, every team in America, regardless of the level, gets together and they set a goal. And they chart a course and they start chasing a thing. Happens everywhere. Here, no different here at the University of Oklahoma. 
And there are all kinds of people who live and die by it. And the media documents every second of it. And there's a whole host of people who capitalize on whether it happens or whether it doesn't. I got to tell you that I think little is, is more important or is less important than what happens at the end. In the words of the renowned sports psychologist, the brilliant Dr. Jim Lair, he said, who you become as a result of the chase is the most important thing. We have in our locker room about four doors down on the right side, a locker that used to belong to Whitney Hand. And inside the door is a list of things that says, among other things, pick up your crap, laugh a lot, write notes to other people, because the ones you receive will be what you treasure most when you're done. She says, be grateful for the opportunity to be in this place. Have conversations with the people in this space that are meaningful. And when I read that, I think about Whitney's career. And when she was done, she took off our jersey and she put it in the locker and it went on to the next guy. But what she took with her were the spoils of the chase. And that is why I do what I do. Thank you so much. You're sweet. In uh, thinking about how coaching has impacted you and the things that you've learned from teamwork, how have you been able to carry those lessons, those thoughts into parenting? Great question. Thanks. Um, I have two grown children, for those of you who don't know. Um, I have a 24-year-old son and a 20-year-old daughter. So um, the question was, how do I combine what I've learned on the court in parenting? I think probably um, the, the better answer is how I've learned in, what I've learned through parenting that I've applied on the court. Uh, it goes both ways, but uh, I think um, Teaching kids, regardless of whether they're your own or you borrow them for a while, um, teaching them how to have a, a sense of discipline, uh, an expectation of, for themselves, a sense of autocorrect in their own head, knowing who they are and knowing when they veer off of that standard. You want to plant those things, and I think you plant those things through your daily interaction with them and through your example. Um, you, it comes from not hovering around them and, and expecting them to be responsible to do what they're supposed to do. And... Um, uh, obviously rewarding and celebrating that kind of behavior, um, but also continually lifting that bar so that they have to reach a little bit and stretch in the process. Mm -hmm. Benji, one of my students. Uh, you You're going to about... get bonus points. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so you talk about chasing it, and I guess with the season uh, of basketball, like every new year, um, I guess it for most coaches is always like the championship but how do you um, know, like, when, how do you know specifically what the it is for each new season? And, like, is it because of the different uh, players on the team? Or, like, uh, how do you determine what it is for each season? That's, that's a great question. And I, I think the only answer I can give you is you feel it. And you know when the air is pure and people are all in and they're giving their best and they're willing to be vulnerable and they're about the right things, um, you get it. Uh, I can think of a number of Sweet 16 teams that we've had that didn't play for the national championship, and they were really right. And I can think about of our, our 2002 team that was runner-up to Connecticut for the national championship. I wouldn't have been happier had we won it. And I can honestly say that. People go, oh, yeah, right. No, no, we were, we were as close to it as you could ever draw it up. And so being in the middle of it, you know what it feels like. And if you've never been there, it's hard to know. But when you've been there and then it's not, you just work like crazy to try to get it there. And so it's a feeling that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Casey. Coach Cole, thanks so much for your talk. Um, when you're coaching and you're working, whether it's a player or maybe in the past or any other situation, when you're trying to help somebody be better tomorrow than they are today, but they're struggling to respond to that, whether it's a fixed mindset, whatever it might be in, in their own 
from just maybe a lot of things that have occurred in their past that have kind of set them and in, in, in maybe a, just a lack of belief of who they can be. What's your approach with trying to help motivate or encourage them to, to see that version of themselves that you see, but they don't see that quite yet? That's a great question that I don't think anybody has the time to really answer. And I know my players are sitting over here going, growth mindset, fix some mindset. I know what you're talking about right there. Um, it, it's different with every kid. I can honestly say that. And the basis of it, the foundation of it is a relationship. When they know that you care about them and it's not just about their performance or the result that they're able to achieve, but it's who they are and about their growth. I think it begins there. But the arc of the journey is different for every kid. And... Um, that's, I think, probably the most rewarding and yet the most taxing part of coaching and or teaching, guiding, leading what it is that we do, uh, finding all those different keys and using them uh, in the best way possible based on that particular kid. Um, th the best thing that we can ever do for anyone, I think, is to paint a picture of what we see they can be. Because so many times when we don't do that, in their brain, they paint this picture that's nothing like it. In the mystery of that space comes this awful thing. And um, so the more we can concretely paint that picture of what their best self looks like, then the more we can guide them there. And it goes back to the old, you and I were talking about Stephen Covey just a bit ago, of beginning with the end in mind. This is what, where I see you. This is where we are. How are we going to get there? And then we work daily to connect those dots. Anyone else? Holden. <laughs> um, who would you say is the coolest person you've ever met? And what was that experience like? Um, maybe, maybe someone like Oprah? Um. Holden wants me to talk about Oprah Winfrey because I, I have a picture with her. And, and that's about the extent of, of my friendship with her. A conversation <laughs> and a picture. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your question and I'm going to go with the most interesting person that I've ever met. That is hard. Um, I've been fortunate to meet some really cool people, but you know what? I'm gonna say one of the most interesting people I've ever met was Mary Jane Noble. Uh, she is the namesake for our women's basketball facility and she was president of the Board of Regents here at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, but she was wise and she was strong and she was wily and she was funny and uh, she was supportive and she was loyal and she was kind and she just had a way about her of um, of uh, interacting with people uh, of all statures, uh, young kids, older folks, highly educated, not highly educated. Um, she just had a special way about her. She had an aura about her, and so she would, she might top my list. Time for one last question, if we have one. Isra, another one of my students. Um, okay, I have two questions. The first one um, is that I inspired that from Casey's question. If you are that person who has a, this fixed mind, what should you do with yourself? The second question is that if you have a player in your team who is, you know, you, you can see in her a lot, of, a lot of things that she can do, but she really cannot, she thinks that she cannot. How can, how can you just help her? to get her self-esteem and so on. Thank Great you. question. You're talking about potential um, and, and what we see in our players. You know, I, it, it always, I always find it funny that um, when our, our players think that I think a certain way about them because I'm like, hello, I only had 15 scholarships for the entire United States of America and I picked you, okay? So come on, come on, you know? Um, but I, I think... Um, that happens a lot more than you would imagine. You know, at this level, you recruit guys who are the, the best player uh, in maybe in the history of their high school, not just on their high school team, maybe in the history of their high school or in their region or in their county or maybe even in their state. Maybe they're a parade All-American. They're like elite. They're the best of the best. And then when they get here, oftentimes they struggle with, I wonder if I'm good enough. And um, it's, a, it's a problem that you wouldn't expect to have, but it's a hurdle you have to jump over. And I'm a big believer that confidence comes from demonstrated ability. So you just create those environments, and this sort of answers your fixed and, and, and uh, growth mindset question. 
Uh, you create those environments where they have to do something that's hard. And then every time they do something that's hard, they feel a little bit better about themselves. And they hold themselves a little taller and they have a little more of that real confidence. And so you give them something else that's a little bit hard and you create those experiences within environments so that they can grow. And I've never met a kid that wasn't addicted to growing once they began. When you feel it, it's like super enticing, like you're addicted to it, you wanna grow some more. And I've never, I've, I've been teaching for 30 years, and I've never met one that, that began to grow and wasn't um, addicted to the feeling that it, that it provides. So I think you, a responsibility of a teacher or a coach or a parent is to build that environment so that they can feel that and let them get hooked. You guys are awesome. Thanks for spending your afternoon with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, she wants me to open it. Well, it's not Cheetos, so I'm disappointed. Oh, thank you. Oh, I get to flourish for everybody to see. Human flourishing right here. Thank you so much. Thank you.